work. It seemed to go right to that lecture. So bottom line is, a nice, a nice thing about it too, is you can just scan through the lecture fast. You can jump from one place to another. Uh, I'm, this is my new plan is to try and get things posted on YouTube. Um, I just, it, it again is one of these, nothing is easy, right? Everything's got to be as complicated as possible. And so what's happening uh, with that is it just takes a while to download the original file once they send it to me. Then it takes a long time to upload to YouTube. But once it's there, it's there. And only people who give the link to can actually access it. So um, it's not like it's, I don't know if you did a search on YouTube, you would, you would find it. Okay, it's just, it's supposed to be only available. And I told them that um, it was going to be presented to children, so they should probably, uh, it should eliminate a number of um, maybe notifications or commercials or something like that that they're going to put into it. And I apologize. I, I always put, I always list that it's uh, suitable for children or, or used for children because then they put less, they put less junk in it. All right, so um, it looks to me like we have uh, 18 people right now, though actually it says 21, so I must have missed somebody. I'm going to just quickly go and double check my attendance here. Who have I not gotten listed? You know, Pima College is still bugging me about making sure that I um, uh, get attendance up and posted. And so it's just the only best time for me to do that is right now while I can get, um, you know, while I can get everybody's list before something happens. Okay, so um, let's go back. I want to mention I am officially presenting now. So you, I'm, I'm guessing you can see me on my desktop. I'm officially presenting. I'm recording this just so you know. Uh, my goal, again, will be to download um, this lecture, download, upload, whatever. I'm going to get this lecture on YouTube so that anybody who wants to double check it can, anybody who wants to watch it again can do that. Um, you know, if you're working on the quiz and you want to, um, you know, upload the lecture and use it, there's no problem whatsoever with that. So um, anyway, here's the thing I need to, to mention. Yesterday, I had lots of internet problems. I mean, maybe not lots, but I had significant internet problems. And what I mean is, is that in my first class in the afternoon, um, I got kicked off the internet two times. And when it kicked me off, it shut down the meeting and I had to restart the meeting. So um, I'm hoping that doesn't happen today. I've been dealing with the IT people uh, for CenturyLink, um, who, that's my internet provider, and they say they've made some adjustments and that um, my internet should be better, but I want to just have a plan. And the plan is, is that if, if we're, you know, if there's a significant amount of time in the class left, you know, like, let's say, uh, it, let's just pretend that it crashed a third of the way through the class. Well, then guess what? I'm going to send you a new link and we are going to restart the class. OK, um, if if we're halfway or even three quarters of the way through the class and somehow the computer crashes and it kicks the meeting away, you may just be sitting there unable to see anything. But the bottom line is that. Um, is that. If that happens and there's a significant amount of the class time left then i'm going to try and re i'm going to you know get a new link send that link out and i'm asking people to be patient and hang you know hang with me for five minutes or ten minutes whatever it takes to get everything rebooted up again and then um come back okay um now if, if we're within you know a half hour of the end of class then chances are i won't try and restart the meeting will just meet again next time, normal time, 11.15 Thursday, okay? <clears throat> so I'm hoping that maybe today, since it's earlier in the day, I won't have those kind of internet problems, and that would be wonderful. But if those internet problems do 
happen and there's still a significant amount of time in the class then i'm just going to have to restart the class send a new link so that you can um you know come back okay and so just thought i would let you know that um yesterday i was experiencing some you know i don't know connectivity problems i guess and um it was real frustrating so there's nothing you know when the, when you shut down the meeting in the middle of the class you try and it took me probably 15 minutes to get everything back up again and um and after that 15 minutes i'd already lost a third of the class people just kind of gave up on me but let me just i want to say it again if there's a if if we're you know only halfway through the class or only three quarters of the way through the class we will restart the class and you just have to look for a new link and come back and we will restart the meeting okay i hope it doesn't happen but anything is possible so um i don't know i'm kind of nervous because i'm thinking maybe i should wear a mask now reason is that some student told me yesterday that um that they got a computer virus and i don't want to catch a virus from my computer so i don't know i mean every time i'm touching it and everything else so i forgot that computers can get viruses too mm -hmm. anyway i hope everybody out there is um feeling good and just like everybody, you're wishing we were in a regular classroom, not sitting at home in our pajamas or whatever. I'm not in my pajamas. But um, anyway, the bottom line is that uh, it would be nice to have be in a classroom, but that's just not the nature of things right now. I hope people are doing what everything that we need to do in order to stay as safe as possible. Uh, again, you know what? You look at the East Coast where they were unable to start things up before it got really bad and then there are cities like new york with you know thousands of deaths etc um, i think we're in a little bit better shape than that because out west here we saw what was happening back east and the governors and uh you know, other officials decided hey time to start social distancing and it seems to be working um you know it seemed to be working in that the number of cases out here is um manageable now and really, we kind of have to, we have to give credit to those people out here who saw what was happening back east and decided to start suggesting things for us. Now, I don't have any choice but to go out. I have to help take care of my elderly mother. In fact, I'm the only one who's allowed to take care of her. Uh, everybody else wants me to be the one who has contact with her. And we do that very, very carefully. But I have to go out. So I kind of see what it's like out there now with, uh, you know, strips of tape on the floor that are six feet apart and uh, plexiglass shields between you and the cashier and um it's just sort of a different world out there with with sometimes with half empty shelves in the supermarket and uh, all that kind of stuff but um i think that that doing what we're doing now the social distancing um you know washing our hands a lot wearing a, a mouth cover when you're a mouth and nose cover when you're out wearing gloves if you have access to gloves, using a bunch of Purell or some other kind of hand sanitizer. I think this is, these are practical things that we can do to reduce the chances that we will get the virus or spread the virus. So um, <clears throat> it is what it is right now. And we just have to uh, trust that over time, the virus will, um, you know, it will recede as we work on a vaccine. I was reading this article in the New Yorker the other day about um, the Black Plague, uh, another uh, uh, another kind of plague that swept around, um, not a viral plague, but it um, it lasted. I mean, it it kept going and coming back and back again for like 250 years. So I'm kind of hoping this virus doesn't do that. Of course, back then they didn't have a vaccine, and I'm pretty sure they'll get it. They'll have a vaccine for this virus, and people will start getting vaccinated against it as soon as the vaccine is aware is available. I hope everybody will do that, and then um, then it may come back, but uh, most people will be immune to it. I mean, for all we know, there may be people who have already had it and are presently immune to it, but we don't really know because they um, haven't been tested for antibodies or, or anything like that. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if you discovered that you'd already had it and now you were immune to it? 
you were just one of those lucky people who didn't end up in the hospital or you know had a kind of minor case of it and developed your immunity that way anyway i'm just rambling on and on waiting for people to join the class and i think it's time to get started okay so here's the first place i'm going to go i'm going to go over to this powerpoint and um this powerpoint is posted as um document number uh, what oh document number 006 here it is right there why didn't i just read it there here's document number 006 cell membrane transport processes powerpoint and so um, i'm calling this coronavirus lecture five uh, not much cell organelle structure and function in it, really, but lots of cell membrane transport stuff in it. Today, we're going to be working on cell membrane transport and the conditions around cell membranes. So, um, so anyway, uh, this document is available on my PIMA as document 006, cell membrane transport processes. All right, so let's take a look at this. Here's some class business that I wanted to mention. Uh, just like I would always put on the board in the regular classroom. Um, and of course, this is for my Monday, Wednesday class. My Monday class is April 13th, and this is the Tuesday class, uh, April 14th. So um, thought questions that we're going to be working on today include thought questions A14 through A21. The um, Tuesday, Thursday cl class quiz is going to be posted today. I mean, I'm sorry I haven't posted it already. I'm going to make myself a note up here post quiz nine right because this is quiz eight and nine so this is quiz um eight or nine which is going to be document zero zero eight okay and i'm pretty sure i haven't posted it yet but believe me i will get around to posting it today i just made myself a big note now i'm obviously not going to post the key to it until um Thursday after we meet in class. I'm going to be happy to discuss it Thursday. But the bottom line is that the quiz 7 8 key, that's quiz 8 for us, is um, posted on my PIMA as document 007. Okay, 007 is the quiz 7 8 key. Okay, and I'll post uh, quiz 9 today. Uh, we'll be in looking at, and I'll show you these pages in the Golden Rock Packet today page 23 and 24, so you have your goldenrod packet. And then lecture four, that's the last lecture from last Thursday, is posted on YouTube, and here is the link. Um, and I just, I just double-checked the link, I don't know, a few minutes ago, and it seemed to work just fine. So it, it is what it is. Um, you'll, you can have access to the, um, you know, to the, this PowerPoint, but if you want to copy down this YouTube link now, um, it, it it looks weird, but it's it's when you upload a document to YouTube, it just gives you the link, and then you don't get to play with it. It just gives you the link, and so there it is. Um, uh, HTTP, HTTPS. This is the link right here. Okay, so you know I'm going to leave it up here for a, a few minutes if you want to copy it down. Everything is case sensitive, so you know be sure to enter it exactly as it is here and um and then you'll be able to go to that last lecture and watch it and it doesn't look too bad oh believe me it doesn't look great but you know if you're if you miss that class and you want to be able to watch it and make it up there's your opportunity to do so i sometimes think i should just run a camera in my normal lectures and then uh, post those to YouTube too, just so I overwhelm the um, YouTube with a million Steve Mackey lectures, which nobody will probably watch. But all right, so um, any questions on this class business? And by the way, if you have a question, just open your mic and ask because we can't raise hands here. The only thing you can really do is um, the only thing you can really do is just open your mic and ask a question. And I'm happy. I mean, I'm not. I Will you be emailing us the quiz today? Um, you know, I'm going to post the quiz on my Pima. I mean, oh, you know, okay. let, let me ask you a question. I, I asked this question to my class yesterday and I said, look, I can I can do I can send you the 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 um, quiz on an email. I could just mass 
nail it out. But when I do that, this is what makes me crazy or crazier than usual. When I do that, I can't attach it as a document. It won't let me, and I don't know why. So what I have to do is cut and paste it into the email, mm -hmm. and that messes with the format and everything else. You've probably noticed that. Now, when I put it up as a file on my Pima, it looks exactly like a normal quiz. So, okay. so I guess what I'm asking is that, is there anybody who has problems getting it on my Pima who would rather have it as an email, you know, just paste it into the email, the mass email that I can send? Um, is it, is, are people able to access it on my Pima? So on my Pima, is it just going to be on D2L underneath assignments? No, it's going to be under, it's going to be on my Pima in, um, the, uh, you know, it, the way it's already been in the exam two posts. So you got to go to my Pima. It's not on D2L, not in that sense. It goes, you go to my Pima. Remember you go to drive, go to, um, exam two posts. And there it is. It's going to be document number, uh, zero, zero eight. Wait, okay. on, when we're on our homepage, we go to drive and then we go, where's drive at? Well, you, you, you log into my Pima and um, you log into my Pima. Nikki, I'll answer your question. Um, you log into my Pima and then mm -hmm. um, once you are on my Pima, you go, you're on the, your my Pima homepage. On the left, there's a link that says drive. You click on that and then you come to a page that, that has four folders in it. And the four I'm not folders. finding where you're seeing drive out on the left. Okay. Well, hold on. Cause I bet you I can show you what it looks like. Okay. Just give me one second and I'll okay. just, and I'm happy to do it because if anybody is unable to access this kind of stuff, I want you to be able to access it. Okay. So you can watch what I'm doing. I'm just going to Pima and okay. uh, Going up here to my Pima, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, so I'm going up to my Pima and it's logging in. Of course, now I have like three portlets open for my Pima, okay? Now, here I am on the my Pima page and where I'm gonna go is down here. All this stuff up here, sorry, you're right. I apologize. I'm going to, once I'm on the My Pima page, I'm going to go here to My Courses, right? I go to My Courses, and this, this, is, is, this probably looks exactly like um, your pages. So here's the courses I teach. Yours is going to show the courses you take. So here's okay. up right here. You're going to click on this. Now you're on our homepage, Okay. Okay, and then I see drive over there to the left. Yeah, so here's drive. Once you hit drive, then you're going to go over to these <coughs> posts, all of these folders. Here's exam two posts. And um, then here's the list of documents that have been posted. And I haven't posted document number 008, but it'll be right here. Okay, and that 008 is going to be the... Um, quiz nine key for us okay no sorry not key it's going to be the quiz nine for the us last tech we... wait oh it's going to be quiz nine yes well it's going to say quiz eight nine but re remember i've got a monday wednesday class and a tuesday thursday class and maybe you remember monday wednesday started a week later than we did and so they're taking quiz eight and we're taking quiz nine but they're the exact same quiz it's just that one was later than the, you know, the when we started this semester, remember about, seems like five years ago, we started, uh, the Tuesday, Thursday classes started a whole week in advance of Monday, Wednesday. So they're just like a week behind us in terms of quiz numbers, that's all. So the most important thing is you were able to see how to get here. Yeah, yeah. So you just haven't uploaded post. yet. I should just eliminate this exam three posts because it's not ever going to do anything. We're never going to fill it. I'm going to put everything in exam two from now on. And then you got here. Once you're here, you go to drive. Once you're in the drive, you see the exam two posts. Okay. 
Anybody I, else have questions about how to access about everybody that? else, but you're kind of breaking up on my end. Okay. I'm back here now, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry, so you haven't posted the, so I see one, three, and two. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I did not understand your question. I mean, were, were you able, I mean, as I said, quiz nine is not posted yet. It'll be posted, um, it will be posted very soon. I mean, you know, I'm going to post it as soon as we're done with class today, right? I don't want to try and mess with it now for fear I'll get kicked off the internet or something. But as soon as this class is over today, I will post quiz nine as document 008. And then um, Nikki asked a question, when is it, um, do we still have 48 hours to do it? And the answer is yes, we do. Okay. So, um, so w I will post it today and it will do, be due back before the next class. Okay. I guess that's not quite 46, 8, 48 hours. It's more like 46 hours, but all right. And any, uh, any questions about what I just said? I'm going to post the key when the class is over and the key is due back. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's, I guess my brain is not on yet. I'm going to post the quiz as soon as the class is over. And it is due back to me by Thursday before class. And then I will post the key to it um, after that class. Okay. So, you know, I'm going to still post quizzes and keys. And I got to tell you that grading quizzes um, that are, um, sent to me by email takes quite a bit longer than grading a quiz that's just a piece of paper that I picked up off my desk and grading it and recording it. It is much more complicated. And I apologize for that, but I'm slowly working my way through the list of things that need to be graded. I'm working my way through that. And um, what I have been doing is as soon as I open a quiz, I immediately grade it and I send you back an email saying I graded your quiz seven you got eight out of ten so you get that immediate feedback to me and from me and then I will record um, I'll update the information on d2l with that stuff okay uh, again it it, it 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 certainly is more complicated than it was when we were in a classroom and I could give the quiz there and I uh, just take a pile of paperwork home and grade that. It's much more complicated than that. And that's probably just partially because of me, because I'm a dinosaur and I don't know the most up-to-date methods for um, having people take quizzes online. I'm sure there are people listening to me right now who know more about that than me, or at least know more about the process and the strategy of doing that. Um, and so uh, you'll, uh, I just saw a, a I just saw a question about when you'll know the your grade that you get. And the answer kind of is as quickly as I can let you know, because I have a hundred emails with quizzes in them and I am slowly working through them. And as soon as I, as soon as I look at your quiz, I will grade it right there and send you your grade back as soon as I open your quiz. But it might take, a little while for me to get to that because it, it's it's literally hours and hours of work to process uh, the quizzes that are up there on email and i apologize you know i could probably one one of the things about working at home is that i could probably work about 23 hours a day and i still wouldn't feel like i got um i got everything done believe it or not so anyway uh Eileen had a question and she's wondering about the quiz. And so Eileen, I know you got here a few minutes late. So let me just tell you that the next quiz we're taking in this class is quiz nine. And I haven't posted quiz nine yet. I will post it as soon as the class is over. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's true. If you have questions about thought questions, I'm happy to answer them now or you could email me and I could get back to you that way. But um, it's true. I mean, if somebody wants to ask me a thought question 
you know, wants to ask me about a specific thought question right now, I am happy to um, try and answer it, right? Just have to ask. All right, so um, back to the uh, PowerPoint that we're looking at now. This PowerPoint is uh, posted as document 006, and this class business, we've talked about most of it. Um, uh, I just thought, well, okay, you can get your goldenrod packet out, page 2324. That's the two sides, I think, of one page. Uh, and then the last lecture, uh, I finally figured out how to get it posted up on YouTube, and then figuring it out is a little different than actually posting it. It just takes a long time to download it and then post it up on YouTube. I think it took four hours to upload this lecture onto YouTube. And that's, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that, that if everything goes perfectly, then, then it, it just takes hours to upload this stuff. If on the other hand, your internet is crazy, which can be a problem, then that could even take longer. So I don't know. I have to admit that I'm, I'm sort of amazed that we're able to hold classes, you know, reasonably well the way we are because um, of all the internet issues involved. I mean, there's my internet, you know, where I'm sitting here and broadcasting. Uh, if my internet's not working right, well, then those are big problems. And if, um, if, um, uh, gosh, oh, okay. So if my internet's not working well, then that's one issue, but then everybody else's internet is also um, another issue too. So um, quiz, just for the record, quiz six and seven, the key to those quizzes are already posted and those quiz, quiz seven, we took before we went into uh, social distancing mode. So we actually took that in class. And then I've graded and recorded that and, re re and it should be recorded on D2L. You should be able to look at it. And then I posted as document number 002 in the exam two posts, uh, the key to quiz six slash seven. Okay, Dominique, so we took uh, quiz seven before spring break seems like well it probably was a month or more ago all right so there's the answer to that question uh, all right um so back here to the powerpoint sorry so many things to click pop-ups it's it's just crazy um anyway class business any questions about it All right, so nobody jumped on in. Again, if you have a question at any point in time, just open up your mic and ask away, okay? Today, we're gonna to be talking about membranes, cell membranes, and really the, uh, the physiology of cell membranes. Um, last week, we talked about the uh, anatomy of a cell membrane. That's where we, we talked about the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane made of phospholipids, cholesterol, and lots of different kinds of proteins. Um, now we're talking about the physiology of the cell membrane. Last week, really, um, we also covered all the organelles and um, talked about their uh, names, their structure, their function, et cetera. And I tried to tell a story that kind of linked all of those things together to make it a little bit easier to understand and uh, um, explain if you needed to explain them. So the bottom line is that um, now we're gonna move over to the edge of the cell and we're gonna start thinking about the cell membrane and cell membrane activities. Now this is called, this uh, PowerPoint is called, you know, cell membrane transport processes. And really you could use multiple ways to refer to these kinds of things. You could just talk about transport across membranes cell membrane transport, cell membrane activities, cell membrane transport activities. I mean, all of these are kind of the same thing. We're, we're talking about the events that happen around um, the cell membrane that are involved in maintaining homeostasis um, inside the cell. So 
like it says here in the PowerPoint, different conditions, both inside and outside the cell has to be maintained for homeostasis. In a minute, I'm gonna show you a cell and show you some data about the differences between the intracellular fluid composition and the extracellular fluid composition. Um, there's a continuous exchange of things around the membrane. Things move into the cell, things move out of the cell. And really, when I say things, I should say molecules. That would be a better word to use. Continuous exchange of molecules um, uh, from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Um, when you look at these, we're going to talk about solutions. When you look at these things, ions, salts, sugars, and other molecules, um, those are things we're going to refer to as solutes. This word solute is a word that means the stuff dissolved in water. At least that's what it means in uh, biological systems because biological systems, they are sort of based on water. So if something is dissolved in the water inside or outside of a cell, we would call that those things solutes. So when you take a solvent, in this case water, plus a solute, um, which could be ion, salt, sugars, gases, you mix a solvent and a solute together and you make a solution, okay? Solution. And this is a, is a topic we have to explore because in order to understand what's going on around these membranes, we have to explore that idea. So let me show you this. This is, is a document that I stole out of um, Guyton's medical physiology textbook. And um, I guess I'm just giving verbal, uh, verbal credit to it right now. I need to go back and modify this PowerPoint to give better credit to it. But the bottom line is, is that this is a, um, this is a, a graphic from um, a medical physiology textbook. So let me just explain what we're seeing here. Over here on the left, we're seeing a list of different possible solutes like sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium ion, magnesium ion, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfate, glucose, amino acids, cholesterol, phospho. That is another kind of phosphate, I guess. Oh, no, no, sorry. This is oxygen concentration, carbon dioxide concentration, duh. And then pH, proteins, etc. Um, then this is the concentration of those things in the extracellular fluid, so the fluid outside the cell. And here's the concentration of those things in the intracellular fluid inside the cell. And this line right here is super important here. This line right here, this is the cell membrane. And so this outer line here is the cell membrane. We are inside the cell here, so we're in the intracellular fluid, the inside fluid of the cell. And this is the fluid that's right outside the cell, just micrometers away, the extracellular fluid. Okay. Now, look, you don't need to worry about any of these specific numbers. Okay. I just want you to look at some of the patterns and all we're going to really focus in now. So, for example... Notice that for sodium ion, 142 milliequivalents outside the cell, 10 milliequivalents inside the cell. 142 out, 10 in. There's 14 times more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. Um, that's a big difference. How about potassium? Take a look. Four milliequivalents outside. 140 milli equivalents inside. This is 35 times more inside the cell than outside the cell. Calcium, outside the cell, 2.4 milli equivalents. Inside the cell, 0 0.0001 milli equivalents. Uh, I mean, not much calcium inside, lots of calcium outside. I mean, this, the differences in the amount of calcium here is you know thousands of times difference between the outside and the inside. Magnesium, 1.2 milli equivalents outside, 58 milli equivalents inside, 50 times more inside than outside. Uh, and the pattern kind of follows 
again and again. Glucose is kind of interesting outside. Here's the homeostasis value for glucose, 90 milligrams per deciliter, and inside zero to 20 milligrams per deciliter. Well, we probably already kind of know what's going on there. This is the level of glucose we try to maintain in our bloodstream, but um, inside, notice, it's zero or very low. That's because as soon as glucose gets inside of a cell, it gets torn apart. And the um, answer to your question is, no, you don't need to know any of these numbers, okay? The pattern, though, that things are dramatically different just outside the cell than they are just inside the cell, that pattern is something that you should know. And really, how does this happen? Why does this happen? Well, I got to point to this black line right here because this black line right here, this line, that line represents the cell membrane and it is the cell membrane that's doing all of this stuff. The cell membrane is doing all of this stuff. These differences that we see, they are created intentionally by the cell membrane. These values here are homeostasis values, all right? So, um, uh, Giselle, I answered your question. No, we don't need to memorize any of these values, okay? Just so you know. But the general pattern that the cell membrane is making, creating big differences between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, that's the main thing I'd like you to know, okay? Okay. Whoops. All right, so let's talk about the types of transport um, across membranes and ignore this handout page eight that's down here. Um, in fact, what I'd like to do real quickly, and we'll bounce back and forth, is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go to one of my documents right here, this document that's called Cell Membrane Transport Processes. Too big. This will work, I think. All right, cell membrane transport processes. So when we look at all these different processes, diffusion, osmosis, carrier facilitated diffusion, receptor mediated endocytosis, active transport, et cetera, we, we categorize them into two broad categories, what we call passive cell membrane transport processes or active cell membrane transport processes. Passive means that the cell does not need to put energy into this. The cell, these events will happen around the cell membrane, diffusion osmosis and carrier facilitated diffusion. They will happen. It does require some energy to make them happen, but the cell does not need to provide that energy. So where does the energy come from that makes these things happen? And I know this is gonna sound kind of uh, airy fairy, but the universe provides the energy for that. There's a certain amount of kinetic energy, movement energy uh, that the universe is always, you know, manifesting. I mean, after all, you know that at the smallest level, the universe is um, in, it is in motion. I mean, we look at atoms and we see an atomic nucleus that's in motion, and we see electrons orbiting around that atomic nucleus. So at the very baseline, the universe is in constant motion. There is constant kinetic energy available. So these processes, the energy to make diffusion osmosis or carrier facilitated diffusion happen, it comes from the universe. But what about active processes like active transport, receptor mediated endocytosis, phagocytosis, et cetera? Well, active processes means that the cell has to provide energy to make that process happen. So the cell provides the energy to make these active processes. And what does that mean? It means the cell has to use ATP because most of these things have some kind of machines involved with them that need to run on ATP. Now, if we scan down here, so the difference between these two, just real quick, passive means the cell does not need to put energy in to make this happen. Active means the cell does need to put energy in the form of ATP to 
make these things happen. Now, down here are very um, simple uh, definitions of a number of these processes um, written by me. Believe me, if you find yourself not understanding my definition or not understanding my explanation, oh, well, then please uh, YouTube it. Because if you put diffusion, osmosis, care facilitated diffusion, active transport, receptor mediated endocytosis, if you put that stuff into YouTube, you are going to find thousands of hits. Okay. Now, the back side of this page, right over here, this is the back side. So remember, I said documents 23 and 24. This is the back side. And the back side um, has continued definitions pinocytosis, phagocytosis, exocytosis. And it has a a chart that we will look at today called the three osmotic scenarios, which we will look at uh, and I will try and explain what it means and the implications for cells. Okay. So I'm going to put this back down and now I'm going to go back here. So I'm going to boom through this types of transport across membranes, diffusion, unaided diffusion or carrier facilitated diffusion. I mean the definition of diffusion, is the movement of something from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. Um, and so in some cases, this just happens with no problem, like with oxygen or carbon dioxide gases, they obey the laws of diffusion and go back and forth with impunity. But then there are some things, glucose is a good example, that it's too big to go through a cell membrane easily, but it it is definitely able to diffuse as long as you have a protein carrier to help do it. Um, another kind of transport is osmosis. Osmosis deals with only water. Okay, we'll talk about osmosis today. Then there's active transport through pumps. Uh, there's endocytosis, which includes receptor-mediated endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis. And then lastly, there's exocytosis. So I'm repeating myself here. And like I said, ignore this C handout, page eight, because I don't know how that snuck in. It snuck in because I'm always modifying my PowerPoints and somehow things just sneak in. So remember what I said a minute ago, there's passive transport that doesn't require chemical energy from the cell. That includes diffusion osmosis and carrier facilitated diffusion. Then there's active transport, which requires energy from the cell. That means ATPs, and um, that includes active transport, pinocytosis, phagocytosis, and uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Oh, receptor mediated endocytosis. And then there's exocytosis. So, Energy is all around us. Kinetic energy is the movement of molecules, the random movement of molecules, right? All molecules move in one way or another. When molecules move, they hit against one another and they bump, may move away like bumper cars. I mean, they, energy can be transferred from one molecule to another when they bump into each other. Um, this random molecular movement is called Brownian motion. And, um, and just a terminology, Brownian motion is that. It's random molecular movement. And um, let me go back for a minute. When we think about molecules moving around, I, I have a picture of there being a certain amount of energy. If there's, you increase the amount of kinetic energy, molecules will move faster. They'll bump into each other more. If you decrease it, they will move slower, they will bump into each other less. But there's always some kinetic energy out there because uh, the atom is a kinetic event. I mean, it, it has movement in it and every bit of matter, there are atoms that uh, display this kind of movement. And um, this movement can translate into random molecular movement, etc. So Brownian motion is just this random molecular movement. So when we talk about the movement of substances, we have to talk about what's called a concentration gradient. Um, and it 
is an unequal distribution of molecules between two areas. So if there's a difference in concentration between one place and another, then we say that there is a concentration gradient. Um, when the concentration molecules are equally distributed all over, then it's said to be an equilibrium, right? There's equal concentrations. The word equilibrium means essentially um, equalness from one space to another. So let's talk about the very first type of um, movement through cell membranes, super important. I'm going to give you some examples of it today called diffusion. Okay. And um, I've actually got a document down here that I'd like to show you. It's posted on my Pima and it is, uh, there it is. Um, this document is called Diffusion Notes Plus. And so um, let's take a look at it. Diffusion is a physical process in which substances, I mean atoms and molecules, move from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. So because of Brownian motion and because of kinetic energy and because of the inherent um, constant motion of the universe itself, I mean, the universe is in constant motion at the atomic level, I mean, electrons orbiting the atom are a perfect example of that. Um, <clears throat> this translates into molecular motion. Now, diffusion basically says this. If you've got a bunch of molecules all packed together in a certain place and nothing prevents them from diffusing, then over time, they're going to diffuse in all directions away from that central you know, that big cluster into a more random pattern of, of spreading the uh, molecules out in space. This is a really important process. And um, that's what inspired me to create this thing I call the law of diffusion. I wanted to call it Mackey's law of diffusion, but nobody would let me. But here's what the law of diffusion says. It says, Substances will move from where they are more concentrated to where they're less concentrated if they can. You know, uh, uh, years ago, before I learned my lesson, I used to bring a can of this really stinky floral potpourri um, into class. And when I did it, I would, um, I would go over in the corner by the microscope cabinet and I would spray for like 10 seconds. I mean, I'd literally spray and spray a bunch of it. There was highly concentrated, stinky floral potpourri, potpourri over in that little corner. Then I would ask people to raise their hands when they smelled it. And you could see it very clearly. It was the molecules that were in a big cluster out in the corner of the classroom were very slowly marching out into the classroom. And I would go as far away in the classroom as I could and raise my hand when I could smell it. And usually it would take less than a minute for those molecules to diffuse throughout the classroom to the place where I could, um, I could smell them at the opposite end of the class. Now, I, I'm guessing you can probably think of examples of this kind of thing in your house where someone puts on perfume uh, at one end of the house, but you get to smell it at the other end of the house because of diffusion, the law of diffusion. Things will move from where they are really concentrated to where they're less concentrated if they can. So um, the reason I stopped doing the potpourri thing was because at one point in time, this young lady who was at the desk pretty close to where the microscope cabinet is. She kind of jumped up and ran outside and, and started, you know, puking over the wall because she had just gotten asphyxiated by that intense floral potpourri. So I thought, you know what? I probably don't really need to do this. I think if I describe this to people, they would understand. You know, when I get home, as soon as I open my front door, I know immediately 
if there are litter boxes that need to be cleaned because I will smell them. And that means that molecules um, of waste products from my cats will diffuse through the air in the house um, until the right human uh, it smells them and interprets them. I know as soon as I walk in the door, if I need to clean litter boxes right away, because I can smell uh, the molecules that are being admitted, emitted from the litter boxes and obeying the law of diffusion. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I had to get up really early to go to school. And um, sometimes I did have to plow through snow in order to get to school. I had to get up really early. So every day, just about, when I was dragging my sorry butt out of bed, I would say the same thing. I would say, when the weekend comes and I don't have school, I am going to sleep as long as I want. I'm going to sleep all day if I want to. And uh, maybe that's my, my, I was thinking that helped me survive getting up so early. Well, so then when, say, Saturday came, I didn't have to go to school, um, I would find myself in bed at like 7.30, right? Instead of getting up at 5.45, I get up at 7.30. And I would be trying to go back to sleep, and then something would disrupt my sleep. I would smell it. It was bacon. My mom was at the other end of the house, a long way away from my uh, bedroom. And she was, you know, huddled over a cast iron stove, cook a cast iron pot, not stove, a cast iron pot, and she was cooking bacon there. And around her, there was very highly concentrated bacon molecules. But those bacon molecules, they marched out of the kitchen. They marched across the living room. They marched up the stairs, down the hall, when they got near my room, some of them managed to get underneath the door and then moved across the carpet and underneath the covers. And then I would smell it. Oh my gosh, a molecule of bacon would uh, stick into my nose olfactory receptors. And I would think, oh no, bacon. And honestly, I thought, well, if I don't get up now and I go, go and get some of the bacon, my brothers are going to eat it all. So I was more motivated to get up under those conditions. But what was happening was highly concentrated bacon molecules uh, near the pan in the kitchen were diffusing out through the house. Why? Because of the law of diffusion. Substances will move from where they're more concentrated to where they're less concentrated if they can. And um, so this suggests that you can prevent diffusion from happening. Yes, you can. I mean, like that floral potpourri, you can have the can sitting there on the desk right next to you, but you won't smell it because the metal can prevents diffusion from happening. I mean, we can prevent diffusion from happening by taking certain kinds of steps. Um, but um, so there are, it is possible that something will stop diffusing if it bumps into a wall it won't diffuse right through that wall. I'm pretty sure that classroom next to mine did not smell that potpourri because there is a thick wall between um, my classroom and the classroom right next to it. But believe me, everybody in my class got a serious dose of uh, the stinky potpourri smell because it diffused throughout the classroom. Now, take a look at the bottom here at what I'm calling some observable patterns in diffusion behavior. And um, these have more than anything to do uh, with cells and that. But here's some observable patterns. Number one, big molecules diffuse slower than small molecules. The bigger a molecule is, the more energy it takes to move it. And so it will diffuse slower than small molecules. So, <clears throat> For what it's worth, I mean, this is, you know, this is like you understand there's got to take energy to make diffusion happen. And it certainly takes more energy to make, to move a couch than it does to move a book. The couch is like a big molecule and a book is like a small molecule. 
Secondly, as temperature increases, the diffusion rate increases. Now, that, that's no lie, because you know what temperature is. Temperature is uh, kinetic energy. When we really observe temperature, we're observing um, a, an effect of um, kinetic energy, because temperature and energy are very much interrelated. And so as temperature increases, um, a diffusion rate increases. As energy, as the available energy increases, the diffusion rate increases. Now, what about in cell membranes? Well, in cell membranes, here's some clear patterns. Gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse easily and fast. They absolutely can obey the law of diffusion and move through the um, cell membrane in whatever direction they, in, they will just obey the concentration gradient. If there's more oxygen outside the cell than in, the oxygen will slowly move in. If there's more carbon dioxide inside the cell than out, then carbon dioxide will diffuse out. Right? Passes their life. Now, water, this is kind of interesting because water will diffuse very fast and easily. And, and the reason that this is kind of interesting is because water is um, hydro, well, water is polar and charged. And the inner lipid layer of a phospholipid bilayer, those fatty acid tails, those repel water. And so you would sort of predict that water would not move through cell membranes very easily or clearly. And that's exactly wrong. Water will move through cell membranes uh, and obey the law of diffusion. It's just going to obey the law of diffusion. Now, since the middle of the cell membrane is a lipid which repels water, this suggests in the strongest possible way that there's actually a protein pore. Here's the protein, IN. Here's the pore, meaning the channel or cavity. And then what is the channel or cavity designed for? Aqua, which means water or Aquaman, whatever. Um, but an aquaporin is a special membrane transport protein designed only for water, right? It's designed only for water. Now, ions, like sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, they diffuse less easily. If ions are going to move through a cell membrane, you're probably going to have to build a special protein pump to help them do that. And then lastly, larger molecules like glucose, amino acids, proteins, uh, other things diffuse very slowly, if at all, uh, because they're simply to um, pass through the cell membrane. Now, does that mean that glucose will never get inside of the cell? Oh, no, that's not what it means. Glucose will get inside of cells because it must get inside of cells. But because it has, it's a big molecule and it has trouble passing through a cell membrane, then the cell is absolutely going to build a special protein carrier for glucose. I'm sorry, I'm bending over here because one of my cats is sitting right below me. And um, I'm just reaching down and petting him. That's how I stay calm in the days of COVID-19. Um, I pet cats. Okay, this is about this particular sheet. Um, this is called Diffusion Notes. It's document number 23 in, um, uh, on the in the exam two posts um, for you to look at, okay? Now, for what it's worth, this diffusion, this law of diffusion, that stuff's on Goldenrod Packet, page 23. All right, it's Goldenrod Packet, page 23. But I've expanded it up into these lecture notes, which uh, I would have slapped these in the overhead projector if I could have. But I can. So back here, we're going to repeat myself a little bit. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area where they're more concentrated to an area where they're less concentrated. The energy is supplied by the random molecular movement of kinetic energy, the sort of uh, movement, uh, the universal movement energy. Uh, I already mentioned to you Mackey's law of diffusion or the law of diffusion, which says 
things will move from where they're more concentrated to where they're less concentrated. Take a look at this little graphic. Here is a solution. Notice over here, there's a really high concentration of, of uh, round green molecules. And that over time, these highly concentrated, uh oh, sorry, these highly concentrated molecules here are going to shuttle out here and eventually be at a low concentration. So there's a concentration gradient. Lots here, very little here, nothing preventing diffusion from happening. Um, and so th these molecules here, these green round molecules, they are gonna move from where they're highly concentrated to where they're less concentrated. Over time, they'll be spread evenly throughout this um, and they will be in equilibrium. I mean, diffusion, as I've already mentioned, can happen with or without the membrane present, like bacon diffusing from the kitchen out to my bedroom or the potpourri scent diffusing throughout the classroom. But most processes in living organisms take place in water and across membranes. Cell membranes are selectively permeable, meaning they um, can pick and choose what they're going to allow through. They're selectively permeable. Uh, they allow certain things to cross the cell membrane and restrict others. So passive transport is diffusion across a membrane. It's one example of passive transport. Diffusion, the tendency for particles to spread out evenly in an available space. They move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, of course. Passive transport across membranes occurs when a molecule diffuses down a, a concentration gradient. It moves from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. It could be more concentrated inside the cell, and it would move outside the cell to where it's less concentrated. It could be more concentrated outside the cell and move through the cell to where it's less concentrated inside the cell. It could go either way. Um, like I said, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse easily. Um, here's a, a graphic that's really supposed to just represent uh, a molecule. This thing here is a membrane with some pretty big pores in it. Notice that high concentrated, I mean, this is highly concentrated zero, none over here, and a membrane in between. Well, this membrane is obviously going to let this green go right through here and this green go right through here. Um, <clears throat> and since there's a great concentration gradient, lots on the left, none on the right, what's going to happen is over time they're going to, the, the um, green molecules are going to move out until the concentration gradient outside and inside uh, well, that, excuse me, the concentration outside and inside um, is the same, which is what we're seeing. It goes from very high concentration gradient, lots here, none here, to lots here, a few here, to basically equal numbers here and here. And so down at the bottom, molecules will move from higher concentration to lower concentration equals the law of diffusion. All right, so when we get back from our break, because I need to take a break and stand up, what we're going to do is look at um, a document that I'm really interested in talking about. Um, it has to do with diffusion of gases um, in our lungs and bloodstream. So it, it's a little bit more pertinent example than, um, uh, yeah, a little bit more, you know, <clears throat> it's a better example of a real physiological event that I think is worth talking about. Okay, I'm gonna stick that over here and I'm going to declare an official break, okay? We'll be back here in 10 minutes. Please get up, stretch, move around, go to the restroom, get some caffeine, do whatever it takes. But um, I, I can't sit for this long period of time in a chair without getting up and stretching, otherwise I get awful back pain, okay? 10 minute break. It's 12.35 now. We're going to get started up again at 12.45. Okay. Hmm. 
Okay. Ten minute break.
Oh, all right. Back to work. Any questions? Let me look at the chat right here. See if there's... Why am I having so much trouble with the chat? I don't know. Maybe not enough room. I'm not allowing myself enough room. Um, so <clears throat> the question that that was posted was, is this on the goldenrod packet? And I'm assuming you're referring to this document here that I've got up. And the answer is no, this document is on my Pima. And it is document number 24 called gas change in the body. So actually, this is something that I normally would start on in class with uh, as a blank page and then fill it in. So it might make it a little bit more challenging to make it work like this. But nevertheless, this is an important story and I'd like to tell it. Um, all right, so take a look. This is called gas diffusion, gas exchange in the body. And what it is about, just to cut to the chase, is it's about the movement of gases um, from the lungs all the way down to the big toe cell, right? So um, we're going to start up here in the lungs. And this thing right here that I've drawn, it looks like sort of a U-shaped thing. This is an air sac in the lung. Sometimes these air sacs are called alveoli, um, and they are, um, they are the um, microscopic air sacs in the lungs. Okay, I guess in order to write that down, I'm going to have to go up here. Um, alveoli equal microscopic air sacs the lungs. And there are millions of air sacs like this. Whoops. All right, this is different. There we go. Alveoli are microscopic air sacs of the lungs. Oops, what happened to lungs? L-U-N-G-S. There we go. <laughs> <clears throat> microscopic air sacs of the lungs. And um, what I'm showing you right here is, um, is a cross section through an air sac, the lung. Now these things here are cells. This is a single cell. That black dot is its nucleus. Notice the cells here are very thin and flat cells. And guess what? The air sac of the lungs are made up of very thin and flat cells. They're made of a kind of cell called simple squamous epithelium that is a thin and flat cell that's really designed for diffusion. If you want diffusion to happen easily, you want to use thin and flat cells. Now, attached to it right here, attached to it right here is a blood vessel. And this is actually a capillary. Capillaries are microscopic blood vessels. And this is a cell that's making up the wall of the capillary. I mean, things in our body, they're built of cells. Now notice again, these cells here are thin and flat cells. This is the nucleus, that little dot represents the nucleus. Of course, this is a tube that's built of those thin and flat cells, just like this is an air sac or cavity that's built of those thin and flat cells. Um, the same kind of cell, simple squamous epithelium, simple squamous epithelium and they are both designed for diffusion. So, when we inhale, we inhale um, our atmosphere, the air around us, which is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then if you add these two together, that's 99%. There's 1% less, and that includes um, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, a whole bunch of different gases that are all at low concentrations. But you know what, when we breathe it deep down into our lungs, there's a lot of stagnant air there, it mixes with that stagnant air. So deep down in the air sac, the lung, the actual concentration of oxygen is about 13%, and the actual concentration of carbon dioxide is about 5%. The reason these are so dramatically different is because we are inhaling air 
and mixing it with kind of stagnant air that's deep down in the air sacs of our lungs. Even when we're dead, we still have lots of air in our lungs. I mean, we can hold about five liters of air in our lungs. And um, when we do normal breathing, we're usually only exchanging about 500 milliliters. So only one-tenth of our total lung volume. That's what we're exchanging when we do our normal, you know, what they call tidal breathing. The kind of breathing I'm doing right now, because I'm talking at the same time as I'm breathing. So it gets, the, the concentration changes because of that. There's less oxygen deep in these air sacs and there's more carbon dioxide deep in these air sacs. Now, again, this blood vessel that's going by, what's interesting about it is what is the oxygen concentration and the carbon dioxide concentration in that blood vessel because really this distance from being inside the air sac the lung to being inside the blood vessel this is just a few micrometers probably i mean less than 100 micrometers for sure and so our blood is pretty darn close to the exterior air uh, when it comes up to these air sacs of the lungs okay now, these things that look like weird copyright symbols, those are red blood cells. And this capillary, as you can see, is just about wide enough to allow um, red blood cells to move through the tube like they should. Now, the concentration of oxygen here and the carbon the concentration of carbon dioxide here, these are average numbers because it turns out that depending on exactly where you are in the body, um, you can have different oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration. So I figured out the average. I thought that would be the most useful, which explains why when you go down here, notice oxygen 5%, oxygen 5%, carbon dioxide 6%, carbon dioxide 6%. Of course, this is a constant flow of blood like this. It goes through the capillary, back to arterioles, the artery, um, uh, the uh, ultimately to the aorta, uh, and then branches again to go down to, to more capillaries like deep in the big toe. All right, so this num these numbers are the same because they're average numbers. But what I'd like to do is ask you to look at this area and see if you can use the law of diffusion to predict what's going to happen here. Well, 13% oxygen here, 5% oxygen here, you know what's gonna happen. Oxygen is gonna move from where it's more concentrated here to where it's less concentrated here. And that's what this blue arrow is suggesting, that the, the net oxygen flow is gonna be from the air sac into the bloodstream because a 13% concentration is higher than 5%. Now, it might be worth thinking about this for a minute. Let's say diffusion is happening. So you've got 13% and 5%. Why don't you then have 12% and 6%, 11% and 7%, 10% and 8%, 9, 9, 9, 9? Why doesn't it basically reach equilibrium? And I'm sure people were thinking this. Well, Steve, of course it's because we're constantly putting new air in the air sac of the lung. We breathe 14 times a minute. And we're constantly replacing this blood with new blood because our heart beats 70 times a minute. So this blood is not just sitting there, it's slowly flowing by. This air is not just sitting there, we have, um, we have it being inhaled and exhaled uh, 14 times a minute. So that's why this will never reach equilibrium. Constant breathing and the constant blood movement make sure that this concentration gradient will continue to exist. Now, what about CO2? Well, in the blood, it's 6%, and in the air sac nearby, it's 5%. And this is certainly not as big a concentration gradient as we're used to seeing, but it is a concentration gradient. And as you can, if you think about it, you'll realize, well, carbon dioxide is going to move from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated, it's going to move out of the bloodstream and into the air sac of the lung. Oxygen goes from the air sac into the blood. Carbon dioxide goes from the blood into the air sac. You know, this exchange of gases here is called external respiration. 
external respiration. And you may think, well, why is external respiration? Why is it external? Well, because remember what I said a minute ago? Right here, your blood is so close to the air you breathe, it is very close to the outside of the body. It certainly is close to the outside of the body um, as blood is likely to be. Um, and so this is called external respiration. The exchange of gases between the air sac of the lung and the blood vessels of the lung, this is referred to as external respiration. External respiration is the exchange of gases between the air sacs of the lungs and the blood vessels of the lungs. <clears throat> external respiration, let me write it down. Sorry, it's taking me so long, I apologize. But <clears throat> here we go, up on the chat, um, here's what I just wrote. External respiration is the exchange of gases, that's oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air sacs of the lungs, <laughs> sorry for these errors, and the blood vessels of the lungs. And what does that mean? Oxygen goes into the blood and carbon dioxide goes out of the blood into the air sac, okay? So there's a definition of external respiration. And this does happen close to the um, outside world. I mean, when you inhale a molecule and it goes deep down into this air sac, the lung, it's just a few micrometers away from your bloodstream. And once it gets into your bloodstream, well, it could be in your heart or organs um, pretty darn quick, quickly. Okay, now, what happens next? Well, this bloodstream, of course, is constantly flowing. So let's just follow the route of this blood. It goes through this capillary. Capillaries fuse to form arterioles. Um, arterioles fume to form arteries. And then um, these um, arteries, this is, this is from the air sac, the lung. These arterioles and arteries go back to the heart, okay? And then they um, get pumped out into arteries again, and, um, and they go into arterioles, and eventually those branch to form capillaries. And now we're down in the big toe. We're in a capillary in the big toe. Okay. So there's the same blood vessel again. Um, here's the red blood cells. Here's the average concentration, okay? And then, um, yeah, so then um, <clears throat> it goes past the big toe cells. These are some cells that are just deep out in the exterior of the body. I mean, they don't have to be the big toe. They could be deep in the brain. They could be deep in the heart. They could be in the tip of the finger. But, you know, when I think about cells in the body, I think about the big toe cells because these big toe cells seem to me to be um, just 
out in the boondocks of the body um, and they are completely dependent upon um, the other processes to work right, okay? Now, um, bottom line is that um, <clears throat> that blood is passing through a capillary in the big toe. Notice the thin and flat cells of that capillary. These capillaries bring blood up to very close to almost all um, all of the constant, sorry, they bring in very close to uh, every cell of the body just about. Ashley has a question. Does the big toe O2 level equal 4%, CO2 equal 58%? No, sorry about this. This says less than 1% and this says greater than 8%. Thanks for questioning that because obviously I, uh, it's, it's, not readable in its present form. 5% here, less than 1% here, 6% here, greater than 8% here. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Thanks for asking that question. I really appreciate it because my handwriting uh, leaves something to be desired for sure. Okay, now um, let's take a look at what the story is down here. Remember the average oxygen concentration down in this blood vessel here the average oxygen concentration is about 5%. The oxygen concentration inside of a cell, though, is less than 1%. Um, when oxygen gets into cells, it gets used up. It does not exist in cells as oxygen gas for very long. It gets used up. And I'll show you how in a minute. So can we use the law of diffusion to predict what's going to happen here? 5% concentration inside the blood vessel, less than 1% concentration inside the nearby big toe cell. And of course, the answer is yes. 5%, less than 1%. Oxygen is going to move from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. It's going to leave the blood vessel, this little capillary, and it's going to go into the nearby big toe cell. Now, what about the CO2 story? Well, it's greater than 8% here. This is virtually toxic. If you, if the carbon dioxide concentration gets much higher than this, then it upsets the cell physiology so much that it will kill the cell. So this is a dangerous level of carbon dioxide. However, right next to it, there's a blood vessel that has 6%, 8%, 6%, 8% is greater than 6%. So carbon dioxide is going to follow this arrow and leave the cell and go into the blood vessel around the big toe cell. So this exchange of gases here, oxygen leaving the capillary and going into a deep interior cell or carbon dioxide leaving a deep interior cell and moving uh, into the capillary, this exchange of gases is called internal respiration. Internal respiration. And this internal respiration and i'll write it down over here again okay so internal equals
Okay. Getting this written up so you have what I've written is internal respiration is the exchange of gases. Okay. Got this right. I was playing with some thing and pasting here. Uh, da, 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 let's see. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So, oh, internal respiration, the exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, between the deep internal cells of the body and the capillaries next to them. Oxygen goes into the deep internal cells and CO2 out of the deep internal cells into the blood vessel. I think I got it basically right. Oxygen goes from the bloodstream into the deep internal cell. Carbon dioxide from, goes from the deep internal cell into the bloodstream. Yay. This is an exchange of gases. It is called internal respiration. So when I'm all the way down here and I start thinking about um, <clears throat> why things are kind of the way they are, like why is it? that the oxygen concentration in cells is so low? And why is it that the carbon dioxide concentration inside of cells is so high? And the answer has to do with a third kind of respiration. And that third kind of respiration is called cellular respiration. And I'm just gonna give a quick definition of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to go and post it, my definition here, <clears throat> uh-oh, what did I just do, I lost it, or, sorry, it's just down here at the bottom, or I lost it, oh no, here it is, say the respiration is the biochemical pathway that describes how energy is taken out of food molecules and transferred to ATP. I mean, this is the essence of cellular respiration. But let me show you. Here's what that equation looks like. In cellular respiration, you start with sugar, glucose, and then you use oxygen gas, which fortunately represents 21% of our atmosphere. Then you do a series of chemical reactions, and ultimately what you get is carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. Now, where did the carbons come from? From the sugar. Where did the oxygens come from? From the sugar. From the sugar. Where did the water come from? Part of it came from the sugar. Part of it came from the oxygen. So we're making carbon dioxide a waste gas and water, which is could be in excess of our water balance. But why are we tearing this sugar apart into carbon dioxide and water? It's not because we want carbon dioxide or we want water. It's because we want energy. Energy we can store in ATP, energy that can be used to do whatever cells need to do with ATP. 
okay? Which is lots of things. Cells need to do lots of things with ATP. So cellular respiration explains why the concentration of carbon dioxide is high here and the concentration of oxygen is low. As soon as oxygen gets into a cell, it becomes a reactant in this chemical reaction and it gets torn apart and the oxygen, oxygen atoms end up becoming part of the water molecule. Okay. Now, that, um, <clears throat> that sugar gets torn apart and, um, and releases hydrogens and oxygens and that forms the water. Tearing the sugar apart, of course, releases energy. And you know what the energy story is. I remember telling the energy story before. Um, if you find energy, if it starts appearing, you can only do three things with it. You can um, use it immediately, you can store it, or you will lose it. That's the bottom line. And when this energy appears here, the cell is going to do everything it can to transfer that energy into ATP because that's how the cell runs on ATP, basically. Okay. Yes, good morning. Hello? Hello, hello. I'm right here and happy to answer a question. So anyway, I got to tell you um, that sometimes this is all called the respiration triad. Of course, a triad um, is, is, actually, I'm going to explain that right now. Thank you for asking. A triad is something with three parts. And this respiration triad has three parts. One part starts with an I, one part starts with a C, one part starts with an E. Okay. Um, I'm going to just ask you, and of course, I'm not really expecting anybody to answer, but what do you think the I in ICE stands for? What do you think the C in ICE stands for? What do you think the E in ICE stands for uh, based on what we're talking about it's the respiration triad well you guessed it the e stands for external respiration the c stands for cellular respiration and then the e stands for external respiration Internal respiration, cellular respiration, external respirations. These are all parts of the, um, of the respiration triad, okay? So the respiration triad is made of internal respiration, the exchange of gases between the deep internal cells of the body and the blood vessels. C stands for cellular respiration, which is uh, the super important biochemical pathway that happens uh, inside of every cell all the time, okay? Cellular respiration. And then the E stands for external respiration. External, internal, cellular. So, I mean, this the, the reason for talking about this, and I've spent a lot of time talking about it, is because here's an example of diffusion in the body. That's an important basic example. It's not the diffusion of, of, of bacon smell from the kitchen all the way in the bedroom. No, it's not the smell of a litter box from the front door to the litter box. It's not the smell of your um, significant other's perfume wafting throughout the house. No, this is um, the explanation for how oxygen moves from our lungs into um, the deep interior cells of the body. And so, therefore, it seems like a, um, you know, like a meaningful um, example of gas exchange in the body, a good physiological example. Anybody have any questions about it? Mm -hmm. So I did put three definitions up here on the chat. I hope you get a chance to copy them down. External respiration, internal respiration, and cellular respiration are all there up on the, uh, de the those definitions are there on the chat. So if you, I would copy those down for sure. Or maybe you can just stick them in your memory banks and you don't need to copy them down. 
All right, I'm going to reduce this. I'm going to go back here. Um, oh, hold on. I saw a question. Um, this page that I just showed you, okay, let's go back there for a minute. This page that I just showed you is document number 24 in the exam two handouts, okay? Document number 24 in the exam two handouts. So you have access to it whenever you want to get it. Okay, and then now I'm back to the PowerPoint slideshow, document number 006, cell membrane transport processes. Okay, so let's talk about permeability. Permeability <clears throat> is a word we've used before. It really is a way of describing whether or not substances can cross the membrane. Like if the membrane is a selectively permeable membrane, then it is selecting what can go through it and what cannot go through it. So um, permeability at one level is whether or not substances can cross the membrane. And it depends on several factors. How big? <clears throat> I mean, if it's too big, it just won't fit through. Whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Remember, the membrane is hydrophobic inside. Uh, whether there's a concentration gradient or not. Is there a higher concentration inside the cell or outside the cell? Or is it about equal? So um, real quick, here is a nice phospholipid bilayer. There's the hydrophilic head pointing toward water, the hydrophilic head pointing toward water. There's these fatty acid tails trying to hide uh, in the middle away from water. And then what they're sort of showing in this graphic is that some nonpolar hydrophobic solutes will move through the membrane at a certain rate from higher concentration to lower concentration. But polar ionized hydrophilic things, they are going to have a very hard time getting through this membrane. If you want those things to go through, if you want this molecule inside your cell, then you're going to have to install a nice purple channel protein. It doesn't have to be purple. A nice channel protein to, that allows these things to move through. Because, you know, there are some polar ionized hydrophilic things that just have to get through the membrane. And when if, that, if that's the bottom line, you got to get it through. Well, then um, you have got to um, build a protein pump or channel for it. So two types of passive transport that we've talked about or we're beginning to talk about. One of them, of course, is simple diffusion. Uh, the other one is carrier-facilitated diffusion. And carrier-facilitated diffusion is where you have a protein that allows a certain thing to obey the law of diffusion. Um, it uh, carrier-facilitated protein is embedded in the membrane. It has an opening or pore, so molecules can pass through it. It can be relatively general or pretty selective. It uses no energy. It's just powered by the concentration gradient, meaning it's powered by the universe. Um, in passive transport, which way would molecules always move relative to their concentration gradient? Think about this for a second. If it's passive transport and there's a concentration gradient, meaning there's a difference in the concentration on one side of the membrane and the other, how will molecules move? Well, there's two ways to put it. You could say that they're going to move down the concentration gradient, which is the same thing as saying they're going to move from where they're more concentrated to where they're less concentrated. Okay? So they move down the concentration gradient means that they move from where they're more concentrated where they're less concentrated, it's the, it's Mackey's law of diffusion. <clears throat> if there's more solute molecules out here than in here, the concentration gradient is here, highly con le more concentrated, less concentrated, they're going to move from where they're more concentrated through this specialized transport protein to where they're less concentrated. Okay. Right, so <clears throat> receptor-mediated endocytosis. Let me go back for a minute. Receptor-mediated endocytosis. 
Where was that? Oh, I guess I lost it. All right, don't worry. I will find it again. Oh, here it is. Not receptor mediated endocytosis, carrier facilitated diffusion. This kind of diffusion, it always involves some kind of carrier like this. <clears throat> and really, the most famous carrier that I'm aware of is a carrier called the glucose transporter protein because glucose is way too big to go through the membrane by itself. It's also hydrophilic. So it's not, it's not gonna be easy to, for it to move through this membrane. So if the cell wants glucose, oh, which it does, then it's gonna build a protein carrier like this. And it's gonna be especially designed just to help glucose move through. It's gonna call, be called the glucose transporter, glucose carrier protein. Because glucose is always in more concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. The main reason is that as soon as glucose gets inside a cell, guess what happens to it? It gets used up in cellular respiration. It is a reactant, so it gets used up. Okay. Now, osmosis is another very interesting type of passive transport process. And um, here's the bottom line. Osmosis refers to the movement of water. That's all it refers to is water movement. Most cells, 70 to 85% water. Water molecules are small and they diffuse easily across membranes through small pores. Remember those are called aquaporins. And then here's one possible definition for osmosis. It is the diffusion of water across a membrane. Right. When water moves across a membrane and obeys the laws of diffusion, it of course means that water is going to move from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. And it will do so because of the specialized pores that are present um, called aqua porins. Now, in this particular case, <clears throat> Take a look at this. Let's just pretend this is a beaker and here's a membrane. Over here, high concentration of solute. Over here, low concentration of solute. Over here, low concentration of water. Over here, high concentration of water. Well, these solute molecules, they're not going anywhere across this membrane. But this water can, of course, move across. And in this water, is in a high concentration compared to this. So the water is gonna move from where it is more concentrated to where it is less concentrated. The direction of the water movement is gonna go from where water is more concentrated um, to where water is less concentrated. So water, when it is actually moving through a membrane like this, it can create um, an osmotic pressure um, that that can you know try to balance out the water on both sides of the membrane, try and con create the same water concentration on the left side of the membrane as on the right side of the membrane. Um, water molecules will move through membranes through those specialized aquaporins and then get um, inside the cell. Now the net flow of water is inside the cell. Um, let me go back to a document down here that I want to show you. Uh, where is it? Is that it? No. Here it is. So this is in the Goldenrod packet. It is document number 23. Right. Um, I wanted to show you my definition <clears throat> that I've shared with you on Goldenrod packet page 23. There we go. Diffusion, law of diffusion, osmosis. Osmosis is a physical process in which water molecules move from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated through a semi-permeable membrane. Can I point this out? Osmosis is a type of passive transport, but it only deals with one, the movement of one molecule, water molecules. It 
is water molecules moving from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated through um, a semi-permeable membrane. Water and membrane are a super important parts of the definition of osmosis. Osmosis isn't the movement of sugar, no. Osmosis is the movement of water. Osmosis isn't the diffusion of bacon from the kitchen to the bedroom, no. It's the diffusion of water through a cell membrane. And there it is, I created another law, Mackey's Law of Osmosis that says this, water will move through a cell membrane from where it is more concentrated to where it is less concentrated. Now notice it doesn't say if it can, because water can move through a cell membrane from where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated. Okay, so osmosis, big story for us to discuss. And really, when you start to discuss osmosis, you have to consider what, um, oh, gosh, I don't want to get lost here. Uh, I'm sorry. I wish I was not getting pop-ups while I'm trying to do this. When we start to talk about osmosis, if you really want to understand it, you have to consider this idea, a solution is solute dissolved in a liquid solvent, a liquid solution. I mean, look, in our body, there's no pure water. The water in our body, which is very common, um, has all kinds of stuff dissolved in it. The solvent in our body is water. I mean, and now it says mainly water, it really should say almost entirely water. I can't think of any other example. The solute is what is dissolved. Like for example, it could be it could be um, it could be oxygen, carbon dioxide, ions, sugars, clipping molecules. Anything that dissolves in water could be the solute. And when you add up the solute and the solvent, you get the solution. Okay. Um, the, the, this is in the PowerPoint. All right. So here we go. A solution is made up of a liquid solvent Oops, can't spill water. Water. No, I don't think that's how it's spelled. And a dissolved solute. So a solution is made up of a liquid solvent, water in air cases, and a dissolved solute. Okay? Now, here's what's sort, something that's kind of interesting to remember. 100% water is pretty rare, rare, but we call 100% water usually distilled water. It is 100%, whoops, One hundred percent solvent and zero percent solute. But here's the thing: if you have, let's just say, remember the egg thing we did. Let's say you have a ten percent. Whoops, am I writing? Ten percent sugar solution equals 10% sugar and 90% water. It adds up to 100%. I, 
So a 10% sugar solution is 10% sugar and 90% water. A 20% sugar solution is 20% sugar and 80% water. A 30% sugar solution is 30% sugar and 70% water. As, as a solute concentration increases, the solvent concentration decreases. Up in there. So think about what I've written here. As you increase the solute concentration, the solvent concentration decreases. 10% sugar equals 90% water. 20% sugar means 80% water. 50% sugar means 50% water. 60% sugar means 40% water. As one goes up, the other goes down. As the solute concentration, remember these brackets mean concentration, increases, the solvent concentration decreases. They're inversely related. As one goes up, the other goes down, right? Always. Okay. Um, so on this definition here, solute, solvent, tonicity is, is sometimes referred to as the concentration of the solute. Though to really understand osmosis, it's a little easier to think about the concentration of the water. Here's three tonicity situations. One is called isotonic, which means the concentration of the intracellular water is the same as the extracellular water. Now, if the concentration of the intracellular water is the same as the extracellular water, then guess what? It means the concentration of the intracellular solute, whatever that is, is the same as the extracellular solute. In a hypertonic osmotic scenario, the concentration of the intracellular water is higher than the extracellular water, more water inside than outside. And in a hypotonic scenario, the concentration of the intracellular water is lower than the extracellular water, more water outside than inside. And really, these are kind of the only three possibilities, really. You've either got equal amounts, that's isotonic, or there's more water inside than outside, or there's more water outside than inside. So um, I'm going to go past that. But here's something kind of interesting. If, if, you have a high solute concentration outside the cell compared to inside the cell. High solute concentration means low water concentration. Low solute concentration means high water concentration. So what's going to happen? The solute's not going to move back and forth. The water is. And since the water concentration here is higher than here, it's going to move out of the cell and the cell's going to shrink up and um, and become all ripple, wrinkled, excuse me. Now, if you have a low solute concentration outside and a high solute concentration inside, low solute concentration, remember what that means? High solvent. High solute means lower solvent. Higher concentration of water outside than inside. So guess what? That water is going to go and is going to try and um, move through the membrane from where the water is in high concentration to where it's in low concentration. So I want to go to another document uh, that's up here posted. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm literally getting to a place where I'm thinking that uh, it's almost time to stop. There's just so much information here, but here's a document that, that um, I think I'm going to um, stop pretty soon. And when we come back next time, I'm going to 
talk about these three osmotic scenarios, okay? That's going to be the next uh, big thing to talk about. So if you would, everybody take a look at, gosh, I'm trying to get this just the exact right size, and that's easier said than done. Here we go, that's not bad. This uh, chart is one that we're gonna talk about the next time, really. It's complicated and I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm about to lose my voice and, um, and you're probably about to lose your mind with all this information. So I'm gonna start on um, the three osmotic scenarios. And I'm going to, and the slide that goes up along with this perfectly is this slide here, which is uh, just, whoops, which is slide 25 of 37. So this is where we're going to start up on Thursday. Okay. So uh, lots of stuff up here. I recognize that. Lots of information and material today. I, well, I, I want to apologize for it, but hey, that's biology, right? I mean, that's by 156. Um, take a, a few minutes, if you would, and study this Goldenrod Packet, page 24. So if you have any doubts about it, um, you can um, ask me about it beforehand. Remember again that these brackets like this, these hard brackets mean concentration of, this is concentration of the dissolved stuff, which is the solute. This is the water concentration, okay? So when you look at parts of this, you're gonna see, okay, in the isotonic scenario, the um, extracellular water concentration is exactly equal to the intracellular water concentration. There's lots of little, um, you know, the symbols and stuff here to look at, okay? And um, so, you know, I hope um, that if you have, um, I'm hoping you've taken the time to copy down these definitions here, right? So the definition of external respiration, uh, internal respiration and cellular respiration, these are all uh, important definitions that I, honestly, if I was in class, I might write them on the board. And if I, um, if, you know, I had a way to do it here, I would um, incorporate them into PowerPoint. I probably should incorporate them into the PowerPoint uh, if I can. Okay, so anybody have any last minute questions before we call today? Steve, I have a question on um, thought question A14. Okay. As, as solute concentration increases, what happens to the solvent? Now, is okay. this during osmosis or another uh, process? Well, here's the thing. The question, when you talk about solutions and you talk about solutes and solvents, then you are undoubtedly talking about osmosis. osmosis. Okay? okay. That's all okay. I know. But, but here's the thing. I actually wrote the answer to that question right here. You see it? As yeah. the solute concentration increases, the solvent concentration decreases. So it, they're inversely related. Remember, if one goes up, the other goes down. Right. If the I'm water sure concentration- Osmosis because it was earlier in the thought questions versus mm -hmm. where we're kind of at, so. Okay, I, thank you. I agree, you're welcome. Thank you for asking the question. Anybody else have any questions before we call it a day today? As soon as we get off in, you know, a minute or two, I'm going to post uh, quiz nine, okay? And then um, you can start working on it, send it to me. And um, if you have other questions or concerns, send me emails about them. Um, otherwise, I, um, like I said, I am ready to end class. I mean, I guess it's a little early, but... We have covered a huge amount of material today, and I think that's um, enough that we should want to process it. And again, here's my advice. If this stuff 
on membrane transport if, if it just doesn't doesn't sink in with you if you think you know steve just has done a horrible job of explaining this then you know what i would do i would google it or i would youtube it because there's lots of stuff written about and great videos and animations about this topic okay so if you if you want to increase your understanding you know we don't have a textbook where i can just tell you to go to a certain page and read um no our, um the world is our textbook google is our textbook wikipedia <clears throat> is our textbook and youtube is our textbook so you know take that opportunity um i am going to post this lecture as soon as i can i mean it takes a little while for them to send it to me i will post it and um uh, and post it up on youtube again it, it, none of this happens fast uh, partially because I'm not that fast, but also because um, it takes time to download and then to upload and all that. But I'll get it to you as soon as I can. All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, have a great day. Be safe. You know, um, wash your hands a hundred times a day and stay away from other human beings. Okay. See you on um, Thursday at 1115. Hang in there. Bye.